Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming on a gray Friday morning. My name is Howard Gleckman. I am the editor of TaxBox, the fiscal policy blog at the Tax Policy Center. And welcome to our discussion of corporate tax reform. Uh, as I suspect all of you know, uh, it's becoming a, an extremely hot topic in Washington. Uh, for years, we talked about corporate reform really in the context of, of cut the rates, broaden the base. But in recent months, there's been increasing consideration of other alternatives. Uh, Senate Finance Committee Chairman Orrin Hatch very soon will propose uh, a, a, his own plan, uh, which will be based on uh, dealing with the double taxation of dividends. And this morning, we're going to be hearing about a proposal from uh, Eric Toder and Alan Viard uh, that also looks at um, how you deal with the, the, the corporate tax issues uh, through shareholders. Um, our panelists this morning will be Eric, uh, who is my colleague at the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center, and Alan, who is at AEI. And discussions will be, uh, discussants will be Dan Shaviro from NYU Law School and Joanne Weiner from the George Washington University. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started, and we'll start with Alan. Thank you. Thanks, Howard. And I want to thank all of you for coming out here today to hear me and Eric present our proposal to reform the taxation of corporate income. I'd like to mention first that our work on this proposal was supported by a generous grant from the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. Eric and I are very grateful for their generous support. And as many of you may know, this proposal is a revision and extension of our April 2014 proposal, which we presented in this room about two years ago. And our work on that proposal was supported by the Peter G. Peterson Foundation. Sarah and I would like to also thank them for starting this process. So both the earlier proposal and the current proposal are motivated by some well-known problems that affect the current system of taxing corporate income. <laughs> Thank you. All right. A simple solution, apparently, uh -huh. if you know the trick. <coughs> okay, so the problems I think are well known to this audience, and I'll just discuss them briefly. There's long standing distortions that would apply even in a closed economy with respect to the choice of organizational form uh, between corporate and pass through firms, the choice of financing between debt and equity, and the payout policy of corporations. Uh, but as Eric and I have emphasized, and as I think most of you probably recognize as well, that the, there are deeper flaws because the current system relies quite heavily on two concepts, the source of income and the residence of a corporation for purposes of determining which countries uh, have the uh, power to tax uh, corporate income. Those uh, concepts pose severe challenges in an open economy because each of them is ill-defined and easily manipulated. The source of income is manipulated through transfer pricing and other uh, mechanisms the, that can produce stateless income. Uh, inversions can be used to manipulate corporate residents. Um, and so neither of these concepts is really the basis, we think, for a sound uh, tax system. Uh, taxing income based on the source, of course, inevitably imposes a penalty on investing in the United States. But given the manipulability of these concepts, there's also a penalty on booking profits in the United States and on having a US charter. So as Howard mentioned, there's been a lot of reforms discussed. The uh, idea that's been around for a long time is base broadening and statutory rate reduction. Um, I think there's been a growing awareness of its limitations that you can't reduce the statutory rate very much. Uh, the reduction you get is likely to be from curtailing depreciation allowances, and that strategy may actually increase the effective tax rate on new investment. And certainly this reform doesn't address the flaws in the source of income and in corporate residence. Now, some of the international reforms that have been discussed uh, recently, uh, they uh, have a little, they certainly have some merit to them. For example, a common approach is that instead of lightening the tax burden on overseas income through deferral, which encourages the accumulation of unrepatriated earnings, that it would instead be done through an explicit rate reduction, which is surely 
a better approach and eliminate uh, the distortions caused by the repatriation penalty. Nevertheless, these reforms also do very little to address the flaws of the source and corporate residence concepts. And so our proposal today, like the one in 2014, is intended to take a more sweeping approach. Our proposal would reduce the corporate tax rate to 15%. That's a change from 2014 when we would have eliminated the corporate tax entirely. Other provisions are somewhat more familiar. Uh, as before, we would tax at ordinary income tax rates the dividends and capital gains of taxable American shareholders of publicly traded companies. And as before, those capital gains would be taxed and capital losses would be deducted on a mark-to-market -market basis. Um, a new provision, this time reflecting the continued presence of the corporate tax, is that we would allow those taxable American shareholders an imputation credit for corporate taxes equal to 17.5% of cash for stock dividends. The, so the, if there's $100 of dividends, the $17.50 would be included in taxable income, so the ta shareholder report $117.50, uh, and, uh, uh, and then of income and would then claim a $17.50 credit, which would be approximately 15% of the $117.50, and so that would roughly match the 15% corporate tax burden. Now, we've also added a number of provisions to the plan that would address some of the concerns that I think spring to mind under this approach, so issues such as volatility and companies going public and so on. And I'll outline those in very brief terms uh, as, uh, as, as I proceed. The um, economic rationale of the uh, plan has uh, a few different prongs. First, we would eliminate the double taxation of corporate income for taxable American shareholders through the amputation credit. Uh, the new plan would place a much smaller role uh, we give a much smaller role for the income source and the corporate residents uh, with the 15% rate. Those concepts would be much less significant, um, you know, and, uh, particularly since the foreign tax credit you know, would often offset much of the 15% tax or all of the 15% tax on repatriated earnings. Uh, there would be, in contrast, a much greater role for shareholder residents. Shareholder residents is, of course, much, much harder uh, to, to manipulate than either the source of income or the residents of a corporation. Now, one primary economic reason for keeping the corporate income tax in place at a 15% rate is to continue to collect revenue from foreigners investing in the United States, but this is done at a much lower level than today, which gives foreigners a much stronger incentive to invest here, or should we say reduces the current disincentive uh, for them to invest in the United States. You could, in economic terms, view this as an attempt to find something close to an optimal tariff, uh, a country that has some market power uh, in the world economy and therefore is able to collect some net revenue from foreigners would like to do so uh, in order to advance its national interest, but to do so at a sufficiently modest level that it does not unduly drive investment uh, out of the uh, country. And that 15% uh, rate is intended to, to strike a delicate balance among those considerations. Now, I can just go briefly through some of the provisions of the plan, all of which are detailed in our somewhat lengthy report. Uh, we uh, provide that other publicly traded assets and derivatives on those assets should also be marked to market. There's really no need to do that as part of our proposal specifically, but it actually makes sense. The current rules for taxing derivatives are a mess, as has been widely recognized, and mark to market taxation of derivatives has been proposed by a diverse set of people, including President Obama, uh, former Chairman Camp, and Senator Wyden, and so it seems like an apt opportunity uh, to improve that uh, segment of the tax code when we're introducing mark-to-market for corporate stock. Uh, there is a disparity between publicly traded assets and other assets under our proposal since the publicly traded assets are taxed at ordinary income rates on mark-to-market basis while the non-publicly traded assets are taxed upon realization at today's preferential rates. To mitigate the disparity a little bit, we would tax those unrealized gains when the asset holder dies or when the asset is contributed to charity, something that, uh, you know, that does not draw tax today. Um, we have a transition rule, if you will, when a closely held company goes public. Relative to today's system, our proposal would have the potential to impose a more severe penalty on going public because the accrued, previously accrued gains that the owners of that company have, you know, could potentially all be subject to mark-to-market tax at the time that the company goes public. In order to avoid having that type of penalty occur, uh, we provide a low rate uh, tax, effectively having a quarter of those previously accrued gains included in income and doing that over a 10-year period uh, when the company goes public. That should ease 
any you know, severe disincentive uh, for a company to make that transition. Today, stock that is held by tax-exempt organizations and retirement plans effectively bears a 35% tax, even though those entities are tax-exempt. The tax, of course, is not collected directly from those entities, but instead at the corporate level paid by the companies whose shares they hold. We would be giving a significant benefit under our proposal to those organizations because the ta corporate tax would be reduced to 15%. Uh, percent. Uh, to offset some of that gain and also to make the asset decisions of those organizations more neutral, we would impose a parallel 15% tax on the interest income uh, of those uh, entities. The mark-to-market -market system will be unfamiliar to many Americans and may arouse uh, you know, some degree of concern among some small asset holders. You know, we therefore propose to disregard a gains and losses in any given year below a threshold amount. Uh, we suggest $500 for singles, $1,000 for couples, that numbers could be changed. Um, calculations based on the distribution of realized gains today suggest that you can remove a large number of taxpayers you know, from the tax base on capital gains without reducing revenue very much. Accrued gains may not be quite as concentrated as realized gains, but the same principle should continue to apply, that for a small revenue loss, you can actually spare a large number of taxpayers from dealing with this, uh, these calculations. From time to time, one hears the claim that a mark-to-market tax would be unconstitutional unless it was apportioned among the states to ensure that per capita tax liability was equal in each state. Uh, the concern is that unrealized income may not constitute income for purposes of the 16th Amendment, which allows income to be taxed without apportionment among the states. Um, an analysis for us by David Miller and a summary of what many other commentators have said uh, convinces us that this concern is almost certainly unfounded. Most uh, legal scholars believe this is not a, an issue, uh, a position that is supported by the fact that the code today has several mark-to-market provisions uh, that have either not been challenged or have withstood challenge. We do nonetheless propose a fallback provision uh, in the event that the uh, that there is a challenge, uh, we would provide that uh, the tax burden would be equalized across the states by increasing taxes uh, in every state uh, except one. And uh, I think that's likely to forestall any challenges, which again, we think would not have merit in any event. Transition is always a key issue for a sweeping reform, and we go into some detail on our transition policy. We have a 10-year phase-in for the corporate rate reduction, for the introduction of the imputation credits, and for the rate increase on dividends and capital gains. On the other hand, we have an immediate changeover from realization to mark-to-market -to -market taxation. I um, actually do that on a, on a cutoff basis for assets other than corporate equity. For corporate equity, uh, we would um, mark uh, assets up to their market value on the effective date and would then tax the previously accrued gains above a threshold amount that's exempted uh, at lower rates. We would there to provide that a quarter of them would be included in income. They would actually be taxed at a lower rate than realized gains were under the old system, but that seems appropriate because under the old system, tax on those gains could have been deferred and taxpayers would be losing that benefit. We therefore give them a rate that's even more preferential than current law. Uh, there's also a variety of other specific transition rules. Uh, my final point concerns one of the issues that's always mentioned and rightly mentioned when you talk about mark-to-market taxation. At the 2014 conference, Marty Sullivan made some very powerful points about this, and that's the concern with tax-based volatility. The capital gains and capital losses that accrue on corporate stock are extremely volatile, and uh, that tax-based volatility, I think, raises a number of concerns. It's possible that in a year where the market has risen sharply, taxpayers might have to sell shares to pay the tax. It also, the revenue volatility would make it harder for states to balance their budgets, which they're typically required to do. And furthermore, taxing these large gains that may then be offset the next year by large losses, which would be deducted then, of course, uh, still may impede public acceptance of the mark-to-market system. It's not clear whether all of these concerns are as serious as is sometimes claimed, but together they certainly suggest that it would probably be desirable to reduce the volatility of the tax base, and so we have a provision to do that. We did first look at the idea of doing simple averaging of the accrued gains and losses, a three-year or a five-year average. 
Uh, that approach does, of course, smooth out the volatility, but not as much as you might want or expect. It also does require uh, the specific gains and losses that accrued in several previous years uh, to be tracked. We ultimately embraced an alternative approach that we call geometric smoothing, which actually allows many years to be averaged, but it does so without having to track the past year-to-year -year history of accrued uh, gains and losses. Let me just briefly describe how that works uh, and then show you a couple uh, charts. We propose for this approach an inclusion parameter of 20%. The inclusion parameter is a key feature of how geometric smoothing works. In any given year, then a taxpayer would include 20% of the gain or loss that accrued during the year. The smoothing would also apply to dividends and would apply to the gains and losses regardless of whether they had been realized or not. 20% would be included in current income. The other 80% would be placed into a pool of unrecognized gains. In, any, in each year, 20% of the beginning of year balance of that pool would also be included in income, along with 20% of the newly accruing gains. So if you think about $100 worth of gains that accrue this year and when those gains are ultimately taken into income, it's a very gradual process that in principle goes on forever or for all of the taxpayer's life. $20 is included in the year that the gains accrue. The other $80 goes into the pool. In the next year, 20% of the pool balance is included, which of course means that $16 of the $80 comes out to be part of that year's taxable income. The other $64 stays in the pool. The next year, 20% of it comes out, uh, and so $12.80 would then be included in income. And so the gain is spread over a long period of years. Note that there is no need to track the particular year-to-year -year time pattern of how the gains and losses accrued in the past. You simply need to know the balance each year. You update that single number, and that gives you the information that you need for your tax computations. Let me close with just these uh, couple charts. We have uh, crude measures of what we call the current tax base and the mark-to-market tax base, neither of which are perfect, and the details are in the paper. There's no real need to refine these measures with exquisite precision because the crude uh, comparison here tells you what's going on, namely that the mark-to-market tax base is much, much more volatile. However, if you apply the geometric smoothing system that I just described with that 20% parameter, it dramatically reduces the volatility of the mark-to-market tax base, although it is still more volatile than the uh, current tax base. Uh, I think the uh, pronounced volatility that might cause so many problems has been uh, corrected. That's a brief overview of the uh, proposal. Let me now turn things over to Eric Toder, who will describe our analysis of the effects of the proposal. Okay, so uh, we did uh, quite a bit of thinking about how this proposal would affect a variety of things. Um, and I'll talk about everything that's on this slide a little bit. Uh, the effects on federal revenues, uh, the effects on the distribution of the tax burden, on long-term economic output, economic stabilization, uh, f state and local governments, and, and foreign governments. I, I would like to acknowledge people who, who helped us with these sections. Uh, on the uh, quantitative stuff on revenues and distribution, we got help from my colleagues Joe Rosenberg and Chen Zi Liu. On the uh, state and local systems, my colleagues Norton Francis, Sarah Galt, and um, Richard Auks here. Uh, on the economic long-term effects, uh, we got advice from Alan Auerbach, and on uh, reactions of foreign governments, we got some advice from Dan Shaviro. Neither Alan nor Dan is responsible, however, for what we concluded. Um, so let me go start with revenues. This chart is showing basically, I hope it's readable, the long-term uh, uh, revenue effect in, in 2025. Uh, we didn't do uh, tra transitions or, or phase-ins. And this is meant to be approximate. The, the bottom line is this proposal looks like it's very close to revenue neutral. I don't claim any uh, precision for these numbers. Uh, the first column uh, shows it the effect without behavior, and the second column with behavior. The behavior that we talk about is not macroeconomic feedback. It's a, a, an estimate of how much corporate revenues would rise, uh, would 
would or not fall due to a, an, a re reduction in income shifting uh, or shifting of, of reported income back to the United States. That's not necessarily uh, a real investment that's involved in, 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 in that calculation. Uh, to do that, we uh, used results from a paper by Tim Dowd and others. However, there have been a, a lot of studies that have, had have, had have done these estimates. That's somewhere in the, in the mid-range of them. Um, so if you look at going down from line, the static, what we call a static, there's a $234 billion reduction in, in baseline corporate revenues. That's two pieces. One, a reduction in corporate revenues from the corporate rate, but also because corporate revenues are gone down, uh, and therefore that's going to raise income to individuals, there'll be some offsetting in income of individuals. We use TPC's estimate of the um, incidence of the corporate tax that 20 percent goes to wages, 20 percent to um, all capital and, and 60 percent to shareholders. The feedback that's in that line is really the non-shareholder portion of it because the shareholder portion is in the next line. So the next line is looking at the effects of, of capital gains and dividends and that's a combination of three things, a revenue loss because we're eliminating uh, current law taxes on realized gains and dividends, a revenue gain which is much bigger than the revenue loss because we're taxing accrued gains at ordinary uh, income rates and, and dividends. And um, a, a, another revenue loss be, due to the uh, imputation or to the credit for, for a, a, a corporate dividends uh, at the in shareholder level. Um, then we add in the new tax on interest income, the tax on nonprofits, and the tax on unrealized gains at death. We come out with a very tiny uh, revenue loss of $10 billion. Uh, that, um, goes to a revenue gain of $50 billion when you include the, the uh, 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 feedback, which is in the second column. I should note that we didn't have any, um, we don't really know what that does to, to individual revenues, the, the feedback of corporate re revenues that could rise or not. This is a feedback of, of, of taxes paid to the United States. So if the money is coming back from um, countries which now, after our reform, have a higher tax rate than the U.S., that's going to end up raising after-tax income to U.S. investors. But if it comes back for, for less money going to real tax havens, it's going to mean that corporations will pay more, more tax total, domestic plus foreign tax. So the feedback is just the U.S. Ta taxes to U.S. But overall, we don't really know what the, whether overall corporate tax paid will, will rise or, or fall. Um, Okay, now on the, uh, a couple of things about the revenues before I, I, I go away. Um, the reason uh, in, the, in our previous paper we had a, a pretty big revenue loss, so there are reasons for the change are partly due to the proposal that we're retaining the 15% corporate tax, that we're taxing unrealized gains at ta death, that we have this new 15% tax on interest income of, of nonprofits. Um, partly it's due to uh, a, a reevaluation by us of how much we think accrued gains would be, so that has some part of effect. And partly it's due to the fact that the baseline is different. CBO is now projecting that corporate receipts by 2025 will fall from about 2% of GDP to 1.5% of GDP. So it ends up if corporate receipts are less, you're not losing as much money from cutting the corporate tax rate. And we think the CBO projection is partly a reflection of the problems that Allen, uh, uh, tax system that Allen talked about in his remarks. Uh, on the distribution, the, the distributional effects are mildly progressive. What's going on really here is that all the components of our, our, our proposal, both the uh, corporate tax and the mark-to-market tax, uh, are heavily tilted toward people in the, in the highest income group. But the corporate tax, because some of the burden falls on labor income, is, is less tilted to the top than the tax on individual shareholders on their, on their worldwide incomes. And so we come up with a, a result that says uh, everybody except the top group gets a, a slight tax cut and there's a, an increase in the top 1%. Um, so long-term economic effects. Um, we didn't do a general equilibrium model. It, it's, it's, uh, their effects are complicated. We sketch them out in the paper. The first obvious effect is with a lower tax rate uh, in the U.S., corporate investment will flow into the U.S. That's going to drive down the pre-tax return on, on corporate capital. 
Uh, the result of that is that investors will shift out of, of corporate a a assets into the non-corporate sector, into housing, so pre-tax returns will fall uh, across the board. Um, more and more capital will, will flow into other sectors. Is, so, so some of that capital that originally flowed into the corporate sector will be redirected to other sectors as their pre-tax returns fall. Uh, more capital per worker means wages will go up. Um, the flip side of this is uh, domestic saving could fall uh, or at least remain the same because with lower pre-tax returns, that means lower returns to American savers. On their, on their U.S. investments. Um, on the other hand, the uh, elimination of the corporate double tax uh, cuts the tax on savers to degree the total tax, so that's going to raise their returns. We think domestic saving might fall a tiny bit or might stay the same. So the, the net result of this is, uh, uh, and we think with uh, higher wages, uh, work effort might go up. The net result of this is GDP will go up because there's more capital in the United States and more, and more work, work effort. But GNP might not go up because um, the capital uh, investment, some of those returns are going to go to foreign investors who, who bring their capital in here. And so uh, looking at GNP, which is a better measure of, of standard of living, the effects are a little less certain. I would finally say there are going to be a lot of economic efficiency gains, the elimination of the, the substantial reduction of the debt equity, distortion, the distortion to payouts, the uh, distortion between corporate and non-corporate investments, and, uh, and also a lot less distortions, even though we're not explicitly eliminating preferences, reducing the rate to 15 percent reduces the impact of preferences at the corporate level a lot. So we think there'll be uh, pretty substantial efficiency gains. So that's, that's about all I can say about the economic effects. I can't be that much more precise. On stabilization, I guess the good news is the bad news that the tax system is more volatile is, is good for stabilization because the, uh, the revenues will be more uh, pro-cyclical. The uh, m market tends to move with the, uh, up and down with the economy. Uh, so do uh, realizations in corporate revenues. But the correlation uh, with our new measure uh, is with at least uh, predicted uh, economic conditions in the following year is, is uh, covariance is bigger. However, when you put the smoothing in, it turns out the benefits turn out to be not all that big. So this is a second order effect. We weren't primarily concerned about economic stabilization, but we do think there are some, some minor benefits here. Um, effects on state governments. That was a big concern with our original proposal. We were eliminating the corporate income tax. It would be hard for states to maintain their systems. Uh, now they can, um, but there would be several. Uh, first of all, we'd say that it's not a very big source of, 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 of state revenues, about 5% of state receipts, but it's highly variable about, among some states. I think it's roughly 20% in New Hampshire, which has a corporate income tax but not an individual income tax. It, it's 7% uh, to 8% in a number of other states. It's uh, zero in a, a few states that don't have a corporate income tax. Um, the lower federal rate, uh, because the state tax is deductible, is going to raise the net effect of raising the state tax. But the state, because we think there'll be some income shifting, that's going to uh, expand the tax bases of states. Um, the last time we had a, a, um, a big uh, reduction in the corporate tax rate was 1986. We looked at the state experience. Some states raised their corporate rates afterwards. Some states lowered their corporate rates. I think there was a slight tendency to higher rates. In 86, there was explicit base broadening. Uh, in our proposal, there isn't. Uh, but there would be some implicit base broadening to the extent that there's a, a flow of reported income uh, back to the US, which would be, uh, of course, uh, going to the state tax bases as well. Uh, the second issue with states was the volatility of capital gains revenue. Uh, if they do follow our proposal, it would be, be hard for them to administer taxes on realized gains and, and capital gains without the, the data they get from the federal system. So if they went back to our proposal and tried to tax accrued gains, uh, uh, since that base is more volatile, their bases would be more volatile. Again, capital <coughs> gains are not a big uh, proportion of state revenues. We, we did some estimates at TPC. 
We estimate there are less than 4% of state revenue everywhere except in New York and California. They're always the outliers. But there it's more on the order of 5 to 6%. Um, so uh, the state uh, re uh, bases will become somewhat more volatile, but we don't think that's a huge problem. And we should point out that the average tax base uh, would go up if, if, if states would conform. So they'd actually get more, more revenue than, than they currently do. Uh, almost done. Foreign governments. Um, well, we were very worried about that with our original proposal. What would happen if the U.S. eliminated the corporate tax rate? It became the world's tax haven. How would uh, foreigners react? What would that do to the international system? Uh, there will certainly be reactions to the current proposal, um, but I, I list several of them, discuss several of them in the paper. One possibility, U.S. is blacklisted as a tax haven. Uh, we don't think that's very likely. Our 15% rate is higher than Ireland's 12.5%. They're not being blacklisted, and, and they're certainly not going to do that to the US. Um, other countries will likely reduce their corporate rates. We, we do expect that would happen. That would blunt some of the benefits of our proposal. But given where their rates are now and where our rates now, it's going to be very hard for them to reduce their rates as much as we would be reducing their rates. So our, a competitive position will almost certainly uh, improve. Uh, we could say the UK is already going down to 17 percent, so they're not going to they're not going to push down much further. Um, another thing is they could copy the reform. Uh, we're not really expecting that. We're not even expecting we're going to do it. But uh, <laughs> but if, if if they did, uh, we'd be we'd be happy. Um, other considerations would it undermine BEPS? Um, we actually don't think so. I think. <laughs> In, in some sense, and, and that sort of goes also to the question of stabilizing the current system, BEPS is really basically maintaining and trying to strengthen the source-based system. Our view is that the source-based system is not viable in the long run. So if we were to destabilize the system, which we think is destabilizing anyway, um, there's pros and cons. Uh, obviously, destabilizing isn't good, but if we're going in that direction anyway, uh, getting there faster and in a more orderly way might be a, a good thing. Uh, Dan ensures us there's really no problem with our double taxation agreements with this. So the bottom line is we don't think there's a showstopper. I mean, there are issues, but we don't think it's, it do hasn't made us decide to abandon our proposal. Um, so um, let me go with a, a few uh, conclusions, and then I'll turn it over to discussants. Uh, we reduced the corporate rate to 15%. We would tax shareholders at ordinary income rates on mark-to-market -market income. We would allow imputation credits for taxable shareholders. And we would tax interest income at 15% of nonprofits and retirement plans. Those are the guts of our proposal. The benefits are it would reduce disincentives uh, for firms to invest and establish corporate residence in the United States and also to report income to the United States. We think it would maintain current law revenues and make the system a little bit more uh, 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 progressive. Uh, finally, there are lots of problems, technical problems, with this kind of proposal. Uh, we think we've identified uh, solutions to this. Obviously, they're not perfect, but we think this is workable. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, our first discussion will be Dan. Well, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for coming up with a very interesting plan. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, I should emphasize my title is not a characterization of the Toto Viard plan. <laughs> I thought it would make sense to kind of put it in the, there are a lot of very interesting details one could delve into, uh, and, uh, but I thought it would be more interesting to put it in the context of other tax reform plans. So that's a reference to the uh, corporate tax reform field generally. Anyway, so. In individual reform, I really think there's a surprising level of consensus. Now, it's true that uh, Diamond and Sias think the individual rates should go up to 70%. There are probably some people in Washington who don't 100% agree with that. There's also a whole debate about income tax versus consumption tax, how to tax the, the normal rate of return. But really, there's actually, I think, leaving aside those points, a surprising degree of consensus of kind of what the thing should look like. Uh, but in corporate tax reform, everyone has their own plan, almost. Uh, so just to give a few, uh, ALI Andrews, that was dividend exemption some 30 years ago, still an interesting plan. ALI Warren, that's imputation credits. Uh, CBIT, uh, 
on en basically entity level tax, uh, Kleinbard's dual bite uh, business enterprise income tax for business enterprise generally, Auerbach, the modern corporate tax, Gratz has a new plan, uh, Grubert Altschuler is an another uh, recent entrant. Uh, so there are just a lot of plans out there. And uh, the problem, the reason I don't have my plan is uh, I'm holding out for Congress promising to enact it with no changes immediately. And so far, I think I just have to hold, stick to my position and see if they fold. Uh, anyway, uh, at that point, I'll come up with it. Uh, anyway, uh, the, but the thing is, even if all experts agreed, even if we didn't have this Tower of Babel where everyone has his or her own plan, it's still not clear Congress would listen. I was once, uh, I once met a New Zealand tax person who was spending time in urban Brookings, and uh, he told me about how the New, New Zealand's famous VAT, which is considered like the best designed VAT in the world, he said, oh yes, when we designed it, we just asked all the American experts Probably, I'm sure there are people in the room who were probably among those. Uh, it was like the, the top American tax experts 25 years ago, many of them were still around today. I remember Joel Slumrod's name was in the list. I was thinking, how interesting that the New Zealand government would want to ask these American tax academics what they think, because it's not like the US government has even the slightest degree of interest in, uh, in what these people think, uh, except to like drag them out on stage as witnesses when they think they'll support them. So uh, we don't have, even if we were all in agreement, we don't really have that type of clout here. By the way, I just, there are also, there are these countries in Europe where they're like one or two, they're small countries and they don't have as big a tax academic field. There's like the one or two leading experts and uh, they really, they talk to the government. There's nothing like that here. Of course, if they try to do it here, they have to figure out which ones to talk to. Uh, so I'm not sure if we all agreed on something, if it would wor matter, but it is an interesting question. Why does, do so many eminent, intelligent, leading academics uh, have, uh, and uh, think tank people have different plans? Uh, and the reason is that there's really no perfect answer. And so as a result, it's kind of a game of pick your poison. I mean, when I say, I, I'm not saying that, I'm not denying that all these plans, uh, I would agree that all these plans are probably better than what we have now, uh, but it's difficult for all of us to achieve consensus, even assuming that we should want to, because it really is a matter of pick your poison. Uh, so as uh, uh, Lewis Carroll's uh, Red Queen said, I can always believe six impossible things before breakfast. Uh, if you, it's just a matter of practice. Uh, for, for corporate tax reform, just have a slam dunk. To have just, this is clearly the way to do it. For that to exist for corporate tax reform, and again, not denying that all the plans might be better than what we have now, uh, you'd need to be, believe just two impossible things. So the first is that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I guess I need one more. That, I, I can hardly read this, uh, what, my own slides. But uh, the first is that perfect flow through of corporate income to the shareholders or to the owners is feasible. We should say owners, by the way, because there are different types of financial instruments that are stock-like uh, in their economics. And the second thing is that taxing owners indirectly at the entity level rather than directly at the owner level isn't going to make any difference, even for political economy and administrative reasons. So if you had those two things, it would be kind of easy. You would just figure out how much corporate income pertains to each owner, and then you would tax that person or not tax that person as you wished. Uh, but that's not really the, the case. So the first thing is, why can't you do perfect flow through? Now, of course, these guys have a plan where they do uh, do flow through for publicly traded. Uh, but when you have uh, difficulties of valuation, when you have non pro rata deals among owners, and also when you have taxable income isn't equal to economic income, if you measure it at the entity level, it's just very hard to come up with a good answer. For example, this is why partnership taxation is such a nightmare uh, in the US and elsewhere. Uh, once economic income doesn't equal taxable income, and if, even if you perfectly understand the deal between the shareholders, there's kind of, uh, between the owners, there's no good answer to the question of who should get the tax benefits. Then you get into a world of thinking about trading of tax benefits and so forth. Uh, so there's kind of really no good answer once you're away from being able to do mark to market for everything. Uh, and likewise for tax exempts and foreigners, uh, it's, it seems clear that the extent to which we're going to tax the Harvard uh, pension fund, uh, I mean, the Harvard or pension funds or uh, foreigners, uh, is going to be affected in practice by whether we're doing it at the entity level or we're doing it at the individual level. It's just hard to avoid having that have an effect, even if it's perfectly true that if a corporation pays tax at 35% that Harvard owns some stock, that Harvard is, in effect, paying 35 on its shares. Despite that sort of equivalence, it seems undeniable that it's going to have an effect. Uh, uh, and the, it's probably easier to tax foreigners, at least nominally tax foreigners and tax exempts if you're doing it at the entity level. Uh, so all this can lead to wanting to have some entity level taxation. If you can't do it perfectly at the owner level, and if in some cases 
uh, you might get more and want to get more if you do it at the entity level, then you have some reason for having some entity level taxation. But then you have a couple of problems. One is the entity rate doesn't always equal the owner rate. A second is that if you're taxing on a residence basis, obviously US, uh, US entities that are subject to the US corporate tax are not equivalent with US individuals. We have cross-border shareholding. Uh, and uh, then, of course, you also have the problem that all these plans deal with in different ways. Uh, if you're taxing something at the entity level and some at the owner level, how are you going to uh, coordinate the two to get to the right answer? I'm not saying all these things are impossible. There are, there are lots of plans that do it in different ways, but it's going to be difficult no matter what, and there are going to be trade-offs and imperfections. Uh, so, but let's just briefly ask, how do we want to tax the foreigners? So I would say, uh, uh, obviously, we're taxing them to some extent when they're U.S. shareholders. Uh, if we think of that the, the U.S. Uh, tax system is aims to produce national welfare for U.S. people, however we define them, people are us and not for people who are, quote, them or others, uh, that would imply that we might want to revenue maximize with regard to foreigners, uh, get as much money from them as we could because they're not, quote, us, uh, except subject to a few caveats. The first is, of course, we're concerned with economic incidents. We're not concerned with nominal incidents. Obviously, it's not that easy to make foreigners pay tax to you in economic instance since they can invest elsewhere, so it depends on having market power of some kind. Uh, secondly, you obviously have to take account of, of, uh, of adverse effects on us. For example, if their investing here makes us richer, then that's, that's an uh, effect that you have to think about. Uh, and uh, finally, there are issues of comedy and feasibility. My favorite, uh, my favorite comment on uh, uh, taxation from the, uh, I'm sorry, let me just go back a second. Uh, there's a Monty Python episode where the guy in the bowler hat says, I think we should tax foreigners living abroad. Uh, and that, that's, of course, the perfect plan for any country that can actually do it. Um, but it's not so easy. Uh, so the result is uh, that we have a kind of a complex situation. What should we do with foreigners? And this is something that Eric and Alan were, were wrestling with. Uh, how much should we tax the foreigners? And that's uh, it's going to depend on th to what extent we think they're getting rents here. They're all kinds of, it's, it's not going to be a formula for easy answers. Next, tax exempts, they add another layer of complication. So we have these uh, subsidies for charities. Not clear how big they should be. Do we really need to be giving Harvard quite a, kind of as much with its $30 billion endowment or whatever it is, as much of a break as we are? They're also in the charitable field, experts more than me in the charitable field, uh, debate how the intertemporal thing should look. Of course, if you, if you taxed, uh, if you had uh, uh, UBIT applying to basically everything uh, charities do where they earn a positive return, then you're, you're kind of getting to the intertemporal choice. I remember once Dan Halpern was proposing to uh, exempt, uh, basically wanted a consumption tax for charities in a sense. And I was sort of, why? Because you uh, favor an income tax for individuals. Unfortunately, the event I was intending, speakers weren't allowed to answer. So though I'm quite sure he had a good answer, I never got to hear it. Uh, anyway. Uh, uh, then we have things like retirement savings vehicles. Uh, even people who favor an income tax uh, would often agree if they, uh, that uh, their reasons for an income tax aren't contradicted by letting individuals who save retirement uh, exempt the normal rate of return. So you have something where you might uh, want to uh, limit the extent to which you're taxing them, but that doesn't mean that, uh, not to do ancient history, but that Mitt Romney, when he put $1,000 in an IRA and, uh, and it turned into $10 million the day after he put it in, uh, not clear that, that one wouldn't want to tax that. Uh, anyway, uh, so in sum, it's quite reasonable. It's not just a matter of, gee, we're getting revenues from tax exempts and foreigners now. So why give them up so they're, they're the revenue loss? Alan and Eric are quite right to worry about, uh, is there an amount of revenue we want to get from both? Uh, but of course, it's very hard to know what that amount is. Uh, anyway, OK, so prior integration uh, methods, obviously, there have been lots of them around for decades. Uh, Andrews wrote, I think it might have even been the early, either early 80s or early 90s, Warren's imputation plan. There, a lot of them are 25 plus years old. Uh, none of them have happened yet. Uh, and all, each inevitably has problems. I want to commend to people, Michael Schler in 1992, I think it was in the Tax Law Review, wrote a very, he's a, a practitioner from New York City, wrote a very thoughtful piece about uh, problems with, for example, that lawyers like him could do to pick holes in CBIT or imputation. Uh, I don't think it's really ever been dealt with or answered, partly because since he's not an academic, people kind of figure, well, we don't have to answer him. Uh, but he, he's uh, actually, he was, con I believe, consulted these gentlemen on this plan. But uh, uh, these things are difficult, and they actually do require attention. Uh, 
So, uh, I'm, I'm, but uh, I'm sorry, you know, I have trouble reading the slides from here. Uh, it's also clear that none of these things are, are on, on the path to happening. So that alone could uh, justify looking for a new approach. So I, anyway, but finally, a more ho hopeful note, with all these plans out there, maybe it is a smorgasbord now, or ta not a Tower of Babel, just no matter how you look at it. If there's no perfect plan, maybe it's a good thing that we have all these different options out there. Okay, I just want to briefly mention the latest twist. Uh, am I doing a can of time? Or? I think I probably better. Uh, so there's this the, the hatch plan that was mentioned, uh, dividend deduction and withholding tax, and this could equal imputation uh, in effect because you end up substituting the the uh, uh, well. It depends obviously on how you uh, what rate withholding tax you have, but there's this has been an interesting plan, uh, and I think what's going on in this plan is the idea. So you have a, a U.S. company brings home a billion dollars uh, from tax havens and would have to pay, under current law, $350 million of US tax. And there's no way we'll do that. Uh, so ha the Hatch Plan says, ah, we'll relabel, as long as you pay it out to shareholders who will get it tax-free, we'll relabel the $350 million of corporate income tax, we'll relabel it as a withholding tax. Therefore, the financial accountants won't deduct it from a financial accounting income. So the notion is that then the companies will be willing to bring the money home. A notion that might be true, because we often hear that they only care about earnings per share. Uh, they don't care about uh, 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 shareholder welfare. Uh, this would be a real asset test of that, by the way. Uh, so I don't know if it'll happen. Uh, but uh, it's kind of interesting. It would, in some ways, be the same proposal to say, you're fully taxable on, uh, on repatriations, uh, but as long as you pay out the, the dividends to shareholders, it'll be, it'll be tax-free to the shareholders, and we'll instruct FASB not to let them, not, that you don't have to deduct the, with the taxes you paid. It's, a very, it's an odd proposal. It almost seems extremely cynical, uh, and also it might push too far the notion that shareholder welfare is completely irrelevant to, uh, to uh, management, because this, this would kind of get people's attention a little bit. Uh, that's not to say it wouldn't be a good idea if it works, but I do think it requires a lot more thought. But I think it is interesting. It really has less to do kind of with the classic distortions than with the idea that uh, managers will do something that's bad for their shareholders, namely bring the money hold home today as long as the tax is deemed for financial accounting reasons to be on the shareholders, not on them. Maybe it's a good idea, but anyway, it's certainly an interesting twist. Okay, turning to uh, the Toter v. Yard plan in particular, so 2014, I, I'm not sure if what I say here is quite fair, because uh, uh, given the, the credit that they have, I, I have to think more about how that, but uh, uh, 2014 clearly was true integration. That certainly is a fair statement. Uh, uh, but the problems included the uh, publicly traded versus the rest, uh, the revenue loss, and the big gains to foreigners <coughs> and tax exempts. Uh, they have some big changes now. The 15% corporate tax instead of zero, of course, they have the credit. Uh, the 15% withholding tax for interest paid to tax exempts, a feature I quite like for the reasons that they give for it. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, they've kind of, it's less of a pure plan than it was. Uh, these were changes that I think were needed. Uh, but to me, they do suggest reclassifying. Again, this reclassification is a little bit arbitrary and debatable. Uh, but anyway, so I, sometimes, uh, there can be actually a surprising degree of overlap between what are called uh, corporate integration plans and rate reduction proposals. Uh, you can actually make a plan that sort of looks like a little bit of each, and it, depending on its features, which one you call it could be, uh, could be a matter of semantic choice. Obviously, there are some that clearly belong in one group and not in the other. Uh, I'd possibly tentatively group them a bit more with B than I did before. Uh, again, you could certainly argue they still belong in A. Uh, but when you're lowering the corporate rate and you're trying to pay for it, if you kind of think of the plan that way, then you need offsetting revenue from either inside or outside corporate or business taxation, unless you're just willing to throw away the revenue, which probably wouldn't be that wise. Uh, so there are kind of then, I would say, two models, inside funding, uh, meaning you kind of get it from corporate or business uh, uh, taxation. Toter VR does that. Group at Altshula try to do that. And 1986-style base broadening, where you lower the rate and broaden the base, that sort of tries to do it too. <clears throat> then there are outside funding proposals that say, well, why don't we pay for it with a VAT or a carbon tax or something like that? So let's narrow the field. I don't think 1986-style corporate tax reform is the answer here. I wrote a piece in Tax Notes a couple years ago, so it called 1986-style tax reform, a good idea whose time has passed. Uh, in this particular case, for corporate especially, for individual, I think it's more debatable, uh, but for corporate especially, 
there's kind of not enough there to really pay for much of a rate reduction. You end up benefiting uh, old investment relative to new investment in, unless you put in transition rules that are theoretically designable, but probably wouldn't happen. You have the question of what happens with non-corporate non businesses. And if the corporate rate is lower, you have the problem of owner employees underpaying themselves. You have to do something about that, like a dual income tax. But if you don't, then you have a problem. Uh, I'm also skeptical about the outside funding proposals, VAT, carbon tax. The problem is. If we should or if we do pass a VAT and or a carbon tax, those are revenues with a whole lot of claimants. So if I'm kind of designing my own corporate integration proposal or corporate rate reduction proposal, it's nice for me to say, I want those revenues. I want to pay for it for my thing. But there are plenty of other people out there who have other things they'd like to pay for. And not clear how you resolve that, really, could, who, quote, should get the revenues. Just because they're called tax doesn't mean, quote, we get them or should get them. Uh, OK, yeah. So anyway, so and also, obviously, if you do that, you're, you're creating big shifts in who pays tax and incidents and so forth. You have to think about those things. So I'm sort of, even though I, I might, I'd certainly be open to talking about a VAT and a carbon tax, I'd be uneasy about pre-committing to use them to pay for this, because there's so many other things you could do with it. So, so I have two in-category finalists, uh, Toter Viard and Gruber Altro, lower the corporate rate, kind of pay for it within the system. Uh, there's a lot to like in, in Toter VR 2016. Uh, I, I do like the fact that you're collecting the tax annually. You're getting something annually. The averaging doesn't weaken that point. If anything, it's good for the reasons stated. Uh, you're doing something about debt equity, including regarding the tax exempts. Uh, they, I, I'm still worried about the idea that going public gets discouraged, but they have transition rules, which they discussed to address that, which uh, can help that. Uh, I do still worry about the publicly traded versus non-publicly traded divide. I think clearly that's the core uh, it problem. Uh, I, I wonder, I haven't uh, delved into this. I should probably ask Schler who, uh, uh, and others. Uh, what would practitioners do if they got a hold of the withholding tax? Of course, you'd have to see an actual version of it with statutory language. But I wonder if there are things that could be done of one kind or another with it. Uh, it just you always worry about things like that. And finally, they're relying on realization at death. Well, we all, I think we all agree, certainly I strongly think that uh, realization of death would be a great change. They have particular reasons for wanting in their proposal, though, of course, would be desirable, arguably, even without their proposal. Uh, it does seem a hard sell politically. It hasn't happened. We don't know if it will. Of course, once you bring in politics, then the answer sort of is often that nothing can be done. Uh, so let's talk about the opposition. I see Harry is in the room. Uh, what I worry about here with Grubert Ultra, or I like that plan too, and I'm not here to adjudicate which one is, quote, better, according to me, but I do worry about the deferred tax. They do have the interest charge. Uh, they, I, they don't, uh, they rightly, because it just can't be done well enough, handle the problem of a big jump one year and then reverting to a normal rate of return. Uh, so uh, our, uh, Alan Auerbach and David Bradford perfecting Bill Vickery had kind of came with systems that addressed that, but it was agreed, I think, even by Auerbach and Bradford that it wouldn't really happen. Uh, so I'm worried there's, there's still a bit of a lock-in for you get a giant gain, and then you're going to only earn the normal rate of return. If I understand the plan correctly, you do then benefit from deferral. I think they agree with that. Their point is that you make the problem less bad than under present law, which I absolutely agree with. Uh, the really big problem, I think, is the so-called so sticker shock. So Mark Zuckerberg uh, today, uh, or rather a little previous to today, has a giant value gain for Facebook. They did not sell it till he dies. Uh, the deferred tax with interest that they're going to charge, I have no problem with it, but it could lead to a bit of sticker shock. It could be hard politically. And also, this thing is out there waiting. You have people lobbying Congress. Uh, I just worry about the deferred collection, even though in principle it, uh, the plan is good. I, I worry that that would be a, a real sticking point in practice. So finally, uh, one of the great tragedies of popular music history was that partly due to the the personal rottenness of Michael Love, uh, the Beach Boys' Smile album never came out in 1967. It only came out in 2003. Uh, this sort of uh, brilliant song cycle. Instead, they put out a kind of a 29-minute joke album the next year that was pretty much garbage. And uh, one of the other members of the Beach Boys commented, we had a bunt instead of a grand slam. We went for a bunt instead of a grand slam. Uh, now, the Beach Boys blew it. Uh, we found that out when Smile was released in 2003. Uh, but uh, Corporate tax reform is different. Some, there's a time for a bunt instead of a grand slam, I think. So one way I would think, again, I would be very happy about any of these plans uh, being passed. With, uh, but uh, if, you're, if you are skeptical about whether it's going to happen, uh, then one smaller way to proceed is 
uh, what are the worst problems uh, that we have and how could we address them more narrowly? Uh, so my big three might be, be first, uh, uh, debt equity, or well, not only debt equity, but also the use of debt and income shifting, uh, problems with debt generally. Uh, secondly, disguised labor income if we lower the corporate rate. Right now, 35 to 39.6, not much difference. But if we had a 15% corporate rate and you have owner employees underpaying themselves, then I'm worried. Uh, and I don't like that because <laughs> I would like to have it taxed at, at the ordinary income rate. And finally, obviously, international is a gigantic mess. So my uh, narrow, my bunt option might be uh, to uh, have stronger thin cap rules and debt limits, uh, to have something, uh, there are a lot of things out there uh, trying to tax extra normal returns higher than normal returns. There are a lot of different ways that could be done. Uh, and finally, international, which I'm certainly not going to ab abuse my time yet more by saying what I would do there, but there are s certainly some things one could do in the international realm. So thanks. It's a great plan, and I would certainly welcome its, its adoption. Uh, and you and Harry can fight it out today about which one is better. <laughs> but thanks. Dan, thank you. I bet nobody came here this morning thinking they were going to hear about the Beach Boys. Uh, Joanne? I'm not singing. <laughs> tell us what, about the Rolling Stones, maybe. Huh? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's nice to be here. And I'm speaking for myself, not as Eric, so to avoid any misstatements for Eric. Um, first, I have to get my slides up. Okay. Um, my name is Joanne Weiner, and I'm the director of the MA in Applied Economics at GW. And I'd like to, first of all, thank Eric and Alan for asking me to um, talk about the proposal. I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, when they approached me, they said, but Joanne, you realize that it's 70,000 words. And I said, well, that's okay. My dissertation was 500 pages. I can handle it. <laughs> um, in going through the proposal, I saw that I can't do, I can't analyze all of them. And luckily, we've already seen um, and heard a bunch of responses. So I'm just going to look at selected issues. I'm going to focus on who are the winners and losers, what are the general reactions to the proposal, how are Americans living abroad affected, how much money does this thing raise, and what happens to the states. And uh, I've spent a lot of time working on state tax issues, so I thought I would go to my strengths here. Um, in Talking about the problems with the current system, um, Alan very clearly laid those out there. Uh, corporations are taxed at 39 percent, um, combined federal and state, and equity income is double taxed. In 2012, uh, 95 percent of businesses are organized as flow-through entities, and they have 64 percent of net business income. It's really hard to define the source of profits. And we have this hybrid international system that has led to US firms um, keeping uh, $2.4 trillion of uh, profits held abroad. Um, a general comment about the proposal is it's very easy to have a broad proposal with no details so that you can't criticize them. But since this is an election season and we talk about winners and losers, I'd like to say that this is more like the Hillary Clinton style of proposal. It's got everything in there, all the details. They've worked everything out. I've seen this proposal starting in 2014 when I brought my class here for the talk. Alan came and spoke to my class about other details. So you may disagree with some of the ways that they go about solving the problem, but at least you have the sense that they know what they're talking about. Um, I would contrast that with someone who just said, well, I've got a general plan to have mark to market taxation, and we'll work out the details later. That might not cause as much uh, critical analysis, but on the other hand, you sort of wonder, well, how actually are they going to solve this problem, which is really big. Um, for those who may not have looked at the uh, corporate tax rates in the OECD countries recently, the bar on the right is the United States, 38.9%, and the, far, the one on the far left is Ireland, 125 um, the U.S. is clearly an outlier in terms of where it stands with the rates, and, um, and it's been that way for quite a while. Um, Japan used to um, challenge the U.S. for the highest tax rate country in the OECD, but they've managed to cut their rate. And the U.S. has stubbornly refused to um, for, for decades now. Um, so those are all of the OECD countries, and these come from the OECD's database. So you can see that when you've got that 26.4 percentage point difference between the U.S. and the Ireland, that you should not be very surprised that U.S. companies want to find a way to at least get their income in a country that will tax them a little bit less than the U.S. does. 
Um, so what have they proposed and what happens next? Um, well, they propose to cut the rate to 15%. They're going to keep most of the tax preferences. And as you heard, one of the reasons why is because there's not a whole lot to be gained from traditional base broadening rate lowering um, reforms in the style of, of 1986. Um, they're also going to keep the international rules, so they're sort of saying, well, look, we know that's, a, we know that's an issue, but rather than get uh, diverted by the whole international debate, let's just focus on what we're really looking at, which is the reduction in the rate, the introduction of mark-to-market -market taxation, and so on. Um, so what happens next when they do this here? Well, for one thing, if the U.S. cuts its corporate tax rate from 35 percent to 15, the foreign tax rate advantage falls sharply. It disappears, or it even flips in favor of the United States. So to look at that chart there, and there are the OECD countries in alphabetical order, the black bars show the, the, the advantage that the foreign countries have over the US and a simple percentage point difference in the statutory rates with the, uh, the combined um, state and um, federal. And you see that before, all of the bars are above zero, are positive. Afterwards, there's quite a few countries that now have pink bars, which is negative, which now shows that in those countries, the US rate is below the rate in these countries here. So for example, the advantage in Ireland, the middle bar, it falls sharply. It's still a positive. Um, Ireland still has an advantage in its rate because they only have a 12.5% rate. The advantage disappears in many countries. Uh, the UK, for example, um, they will no longer have the advantage over the US. And in some cases, the advantage flips, for example, in Germany and in France and in Belgium. So um, companies looking to see whether or not they're going to have a higher rate in the foreign country will see, well, now, in fact, the US is, is in fact, a low country. So in going through the paper, I started to look at who are the winners and losers. I wanted to take a slightly different focus in my analysis here. After all, this is a campaign season, right? And so there are winners and there are losers. And what we want to try to figure out is, are the winners out there? Are there more winners out there than losers out there? And then who are the winners and who are the losers? We all know that you really need to know who your opposition is. And so what I'm trying to do is I go through their proposal and I say, OK, here are the winners and here are the losers, and here are the reasons why. I'm saying that I did not do original research on finding these winners and losers. I turned to many, many studies, many of them published in tax notes, um, to, to look at them. But just to look at, what, who do Eric and Alan identify? Well, the winners, domestic investors. They have the corporate rate cut. That's great. Foreign owners of closely held businesses, corporations with deferred tax liabilities. And the one which I highlighted, which is the IRS, because it's easier to combat, combat income shifting when there's not such a huge difference between the US rate and the foreign rate or the average foreign rate. So on, on its face, you would say, OK, the, the benefit of shifting income out of the US is much, much smaller if the US rate is only 15 or 20 counting states rather than 40%. The losers, they say foreign countries who have a, a rate above the US rate, publicly traded businesses with lots of tax deductions, which are now worth less than they were before. Um, corporations with too many business tax credits they can't use, and shareholders with imputation tax credits where they're going to get less of a, a tax break there. But it's clear that, as, as in all proposals, that you, you've gotten winners and you have losers. So who wins or loses depends on why they win or lose. And um, since I can't read that far away, I'm going to look at my notes here. <laughs> um, it basically depends upon um, the, on why. Some companies with deferred tax assets and deferred tax uh, liabilities are not affected by tax, ranges, tax changes. Is deferred compensation important for these companies? Do they have a lot of um, investments? Is, um, do they have tax loss credits carry forwards? Um, do they have a lot of unremitted earnings in their foreign subsidiaries? Um, looking at the things that make a company a winner or a loser helps focus on why they're winning and losing, and, and how do we maybe modify the proposal to um, deal with these. And by the way, Eric, in finishing his talk, he, he concluded by saying that what our proposal does is it reduces the disincentives to invest in the US. And I actually would put a much more positive statement than reduce the disincentives. I would say it actually creates incentives, put it much more positively, because I, I really think that, that it does that. Um, in looking at the... Um, the uh, winners and losers, it's also important to see that there's a real big divide um, across industries. And that's where, in terms of looking at who might be winning or losing, you need to know, well, which kind of companies are in which industry, and are they uh, a company that may have a lot of um, 
uh, be affected quite heavily by the change in the tax rates. And the footnote there um, refers to a few of the studies that I looked at. Uh, Jim Paterberg did one of the first ones published in the NTJ in 2011, a study by Tom Newbig and his colleagues, also published in, uh, published in Tax Notes, and then by um, Doug Shackelford and his colleagues and Mike Caligari there. So to turn to the first, first slide, um, who are the winners and losers in the top 50 US public companies? Well, winners, as I've mentioned, are those that have deferred tax liabilities. And uh, Tom Newbig and his, and his colleagues looked at the top 50 country, companies and found that 31 of them were in a net deferred tax liability position. And they had 465 billion, mostly due to accelerated depreciation and intangible investments. And these guys would, these um, firms would benefit both because their financial statement effective tax rate falls and their net deferred tax liability falls. On the other side, the losers, they have deferred tax assets greater than zero. You cut the tax rate, and those, are, those assets are now worth less. 19 of the top 50 had deferred tax assets back in 2010, and they had a net deferred tax asset uh, after taking into account valuation um, allowances of nearly $400 billion, mostly due to um, tax loss credit carry forwards and deferred compensation. These guys lose because their financial statement effective tax rate increases and their net uh, deferred tax asset falls. So who are these companies? Um, for that, I turned to a study by Jana Rady, uh, Jerry Seidman, and Doug Shackelford, also from Tax Notes. And those on the left-hand side, winners. We've got Berkshire Hathaway, ExxonMobil, Pfizer, Target, Wells Fargo. Um, on the right-hand side, the losers are a bunch of financial uh, institutions, plus HP, IBM, Lockheed Martin, and Boeing. What stands out there is that you've got all those, all those banks on the right-hand side. Well, re well, recall that these are data that are from about 2010, and there was a gigantic uh, financial crisis in 2008. Many, many of the banks lost a lot of money. The one bank that actually managed to survive and, and all was Wells Fargo. So um, that's why they don't have a lot of these uh, tax loss carry forwards. So there's a, an indication of some of the companies that might win and lose, and you really only know who the winners and losers are if you can actually take a look at their um, own financial statements. And again, you have to use financial statement data because only people like uh, Harry Grubert actually can look at the, the tax return data. <laughs> um, so winners and losers among a broader group of companies. Um, uh, after the recession, here's another tax notes article, and I thought that was sort of interesting to look at because if you want to just get a broad sense of who's going to win and who's going to lose, you maybe a particular company might have some twist in its financial statements, but just if you're going to go out and sort of present your proposal and say, okay, here are the groups that are going to win, well, in this case here, uh, Caligari identified the winners as in railroads, drilling, utilities, telecoms, and pharmaceuticals. Whereas the losers are machinery, chemicals, IT, high tech, and financial companies. Uh, that's what we've seen before. But I, th I think it's useful when you're looking at a policy to not just look at the specific details of the tax law and the rules that might change, but to find out who, in fact, is going to be affected by this and how are they going to be affected. Because we saw that when um, the US was doing a, um, uh, the repatriation tax holiday from a decade or so ago that Congress, when it actually came down to looking at the change in tax rates, um, made a lot of modifications to the actual law so that it would avoid creating losers out of certain companies. And at some point, the domestic production deduction was created as a way to assist the companies that might have lost from a strict uh, rate, uh, rate cut. So we can expect Congress to try to make everyone a winner. <laughs> uh, so, again, uh, taking a look at well, who are these companies in these industries, and this is a very nice paper if you want to take a look at if you want to really know the specifics. So, go out there, guys, here are your allies, the companies on the winning side, and your losers over there. You've got Amazon.com, Applied Materials, um, Dow Chemical, but go ahead and, and uh, get a hold of Union Pacific and Disney and News Corp and say, hey, we've got a proposal that you're going to like. And in that way, you're going to be uh, getting the winners on your side, and the losers are going to be uh, outflanked, hopefully. <laughs> um, so that's the, that's the end of my talk about the corporate tax uh, rate um, um, section and who are the winners and losers. And I encourage you to take a, you know, to really think about why these companies win or lose, and also to, to, to realize that just because a company is in a, a DTA net 
positive DTA or DTL position. It doesn't mean that the rate cut will affect them, because there's a lot of changes that, that I say to a, a tax credit, if they have tax credits, that's not going to be a big deal because the rate won't affect them. But if they benefit a lot from deductions, then they will be affected by those. So I just have four general comments um, to make and then um, to, to wind things up. Um, I had a lot of fun with this proposal. Alan very kindly came to my class and talked about this proposal, and this is now the t second time I've done it. And they had some very good comments there, and one of them is that, well, this seems sort of complicated. How are we going to make people understand how this works? Um, that is a clear, a clear issue there, and I think that the way they deal with the mark-to-market and the uh, capital gains taxation is, is very clever, and, and I like it, and, and we talked about it quite a bit there. Um, when Alan presented it to the class, the proposal still had the zero corporate tax rate, and um, these public finance students really saw that that was a real, a real difficult issue just to sell the notion that you're not going to tax corporations. So politics, may, we may think that it shouldn't matter so much, but clearly having a zero rate is, would be a problem. And I would also say that if the U.S. went to a zero tax rate, I'm not so sure we might not be at least looked at as a tax haven, because way back when I worked on the OECD's tax competition project when I was at the Treasury Department, the first thing we looked at in trying to find a tax haven was do they have a corporate income, do they tax corporate income? So it's not as, as simple, but I, I agree, I don't think that uh, they would throw the U.S. on the blacklist uh, right away. Um, so um, the other one that was key was that a tax on income that you don't actually have might be problematic, and I think that, again, that the, the way they, they create this pool of capital gains um, deals with that issue very nicely. Um, FATCA, just one comment. I lived in Brussels for a long time, and I just came back from Belgium, and we actually started talking about FATCA, I mean, <laughs> in French. And um, actually, Americans are having a hard time opening bank accounts in foreign banks because of these new rules. It's, it's, it is creating a problem for Americans living abroad. The banks don't want to have to deal with the rules. And in fact, these Belgians I was talking to were saying, well, why would anyone keep their US citizenship if they're going to be living abroad um, the whole time? So that is an issue there. On the, on the revenue, I just want to say that the proposal with feedback would cut corporate tax receipts by the federal government in half, but it's already not a very big amount. It's only, it's only about 10% of the U.S., uh, the federal revenue anyway. I actually think that there would be a much bigger revenue pickup because if you think that there's a lot of income shifted abroad because of that 26 percentage point difference, why wouldn't a lot more come back? Now, obviously, all the domestic companies um, aren't going to be doing that, but when you take a look at the foreign difference with the new U.S. rate, there are only five, com five countries on that right-hand side there who have a, an advantage over the U.S., and everyone else is either at the same or lower. And that would be a huge shift from where the U.S. has been over the past couple of decades. Um, Ireland, of course, does maintain its, uh, its uh, advantage there. So where might these profits come from? I looked at Tim Dowd's really good article, um, which just came out, and Eric and Alan say that, well, if the profits come back from high tax countries, then we're likely to get more revenue, and more income, and by, con by consequence, more revenue. And so I looked at them, and there are six countries that account for about half of US uh, the E&P of, uh, of American companies. Four that are in the OECD, two of those would, have would be countries whose rates would now be above the U.S. rate, including Netherlands, which has 15% of foreign e of ENP now, and, and Luxembourg with six. So I would say that if you look at those countries, you would say, well, in your analysis, you could refine it a bit and say, okay, we do have a lot of income that might come back from these countries because there's a lot in these countries with high rates. Um, I want to make a couple comments on the state uh, corporate income tax. Um, and if you look at the bold line at the bottom there, that you might say, well, state taxes are such a small share of total, the total tax burden, why bother? And yes, when you're looking at a 6% average compared to 35, yeah, it's only 17% of the rate. But if the U.S. rate goes to 15, the, the average state one stays at 6, now the state rate is 40% of the federal rate, and now it's going to really start to matter relative to where it was before. So I would say that you, I don't think you can just wave your hands and say that it's not, um, doesn't matter. One thing that I, I wanted to mention was um, I, did, I did do a lot, of, I, a lot of work on the state tax systems, and you can't just look at the, at the tax rate because they use the system of formulary apportionment and the effective tax rate, say, on capital is a product of not just the tax, of, of the tax rate and the weight on the capital. So if you take a look at California up there, they used to have a double-weighted sales factor, and that made the effective tax rate on property or capital to be about 2.2%. 
They have the same tax rate, but now they don't have capital in the formula, so there's an effective tax rate of zero on capital. I think that has a much bigger impact, and the work that I've done does show that that has a bigger impact than the rate changes. I didn't go back to look to see how they changed their formula um, in 86, um, but, um, but I, that would be an issue there. The US average state tax rate has fallen from seven to six, but the average weight on capital in the middle, take a look at that, it's, gone, it's fallen from 24% to only 13%. So the states are really trying to encourage companies to invest there. These are multi-state um, tax um, companies. Finally, let me look at the winners and losers from the states. So the winners are those with the low tax rates. The deductibility of federal taxes is now worth a lot less. But look at the bottom right-hand side there. And in bold, I put all states lose because the state tax rate is now much more important um, relative to the federal rate than it was before. So that's, that's it for me. I want to thank you for inviting me here. And um, I encourage your uh, questions and comments. Let's ask uh, Eric and Alan if they have any very quick comments to uh, Joanne and Dan's comments, and then we'll open it up for questions for at least a few minutes. I don't know how to get this to work. Yeah, up there. Yeah. I'm on. Okay. So my uh, my only quick comment to Joanne, I want to get this into too detail. I think it's very interesting what she said about the DTLs and the DTAs, but uh, to reemphasize, there's a lot more going on in terms of how different industries or firms are affected, particularly if you're looking at their tax burdens going forward. And, uh, you know, for example, finance, which has a pretty high effective tax rate, from my understanding, I would guess would be a beneficiary rather than a loser in spite of their, uh, in the long run, in spite of the current uh, position. So uh, I think this is an, an interesting area which, uh, which uh, somebody should do more work on. Not prepared to do it myself now. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, let's I want to thank both uh, both Dan and Joanne for yeah. really great comments. Okay, let's give you all a chance to ask some questions. Um, please introduce yourself, and we are short on time, so please just ask a question. Don't make a speech. I know you all feel very strongly about this issue, and wait for the microphone. The gentleman with the mic is over there. Um, first question: um, This woman in the front. Thank you. My name is Li Yang. Thanks for your, your presentation. But my question is, uh, I didn't really hear exactly the, the reason of tax reform. My thinking is that for tax reform, you are considering about the balance of government expenditure and revenue. And then you consider the equity or fairness of tax uh, taxation burden to both corporation and individual or small businesses. So I just wonder if you can really address those issues because a lot of corporation, they have a lot of expenditures which are unjustified. They, they have lobbyists for, uh, for unjust reason at the expense of societies. And they have a contractor for abuse and fraud. And so, including all the disservice of their employee, a lot of, a lot of them are not really justified. You can tax all those revenue they receive, including individual investment to the corporations, and then really try to probably abolish individual taxes. And then if you can really el eliminate or restriction of their expenditures for the bonuses of their lobbies, expenditure, and CEO payment. Okay, so, I, think we, I think we've got the question. And uh, besides, I want okay, to emphasize, okay, that IRS you. audit to okay. individuals, that worked to my individual, that is really a tremendous burden to individual. And okay, uh, thank I'm, you very much. I think we got the gist of your question. Uh, any, any response? I think the taxing at the shareholder level would uh, to the, to the greater extent that we do under this proposal, would sidestep the difficulties of implementing the corporate income tax, would shift it, the tax base to a, something that can be more easily administered. Okay, uh, back here. Hi, my name is Michelle Sternthal. I'm with Main Street Alliance. We're a network of small business organizations across the country. And in terms of the winners and losers, I was, um, uh, Joanne, I would, I would be really interested in seeing what your analysis is in terms of these proposals for small businesses who um, I, we've often heard in, in the current uh, international tax um, regime currently feel that they are um, 
having to pay high, effective high tax rates while corporations will use tax deductions. So in the calculus, how do small businesses um, fare? Um, well, I haven't taken a close look at it, but I would say that since the proposal it reduces the rates and keeps all of the tax preferences, that, that small business would benefit in that way. There's nothing particular in it that addresses small business that I can see. Uh, the fact that there's no change to the international rules if a small business is just domestic, again, um, it's just you get, you get the benefit of the rate reduction, but not uh, losing your, um, um, not having a base broadening. Well, realization of death would affect them. Right. Well, I mean, I think also since most of the small businesses are pass-throughs uh, today, um, and uh, this isn't really uh, keeping the pass-through taxation all that different than it was before. I mean, the pass-throughs would lose some of their relative advantage relative to uh, C corporations, so that might be perceived as hurting them, but they still would have some benefit. Yeah, I mean, one of the purposes of trying to remove the double tax uh, on corporate income, of course, is to ease the bias against the corporate form, the bias in favor of the pass-through form. So there would be a relative shift in that respect. In terms of directly affecting the pass-throughs, I mean, there'd be no change in their rate, but there would be a taxation at death, and uh, I guess we're also removing the, do the domestic production activities deduction for all firms, including pass-throughs. Okay. Yes, sir. On the blue shirt. <coughs> Hi, how are you? My name is um, Parag. Uh, my question was in regards to the whole idea of cutting the corporate, the statutory corporate tax rate. Very often, it was pointed out um, how how much higher the corporate tax, the statutory rate is in the U.S. compared to other countries. My question is, how many corporations actually end up paying the statutory rate? I mean, that's a good that that's a good question, but I think you know. We're concerned with a high uh, statutory rate, even if corporations aren't paying the the the, the, the high rate. The, the, what we're really interested in is collecting money from the owners of corporate shares. That's the appropriate amount of tax they should be paying, commensurate with their income. And so, you know, if today uh, a corporation, because of the high high rate and other factors, is shifting income, uh, able to shift income elsewhere, then those shareholders are not bearing their appropriate burden. Yeah. Your questions? Yes, sir, in the back. Hi, uh, my name's Tim McDonald. I'm the head of tax at Procter & Gamble, um, but it's not an official company comment. But I, <laughs> I would uh, comment two things and then have a question. The comments are, I think your 2.0 is a vast improvement because A, um, competent authority is a relevant mechanism. You didn't mention it in your paper, but if our treasury has no seat at the table because we go to zero, there's no way to defend the cross-border flows. As long as we stay in the game because everyone else still has an income tax, that's an important thing to, to emphasize as a selling point. Number two on the advantages of 2.0 is the world of BEPS is going to change a, a forward-looking world as far as how you think about the volatility of the tax policy globally. And it creates a really strong incentive to actually headquarter your your tax principle in the US. So if you can get the rate competitive, like a 15% rate, and you're looking at anarchy on a foreign to foreign basis, it will motivate a lot of companies to actually reconsider their whole strategy and flip it back to the US. So I think your behavioral response, because of what's gonna happen on source to source taxation, is gonna actually have a stronger response than it has historically because of BEPS. Uh, my question is, you went to a mark to market uh, immediately, but you phased in the rates. Your paper <laughs> talks to the sensitivity of mobile income. And I was just wondering, if there's a lot of sensitivity, why wouldn't you accelerate the rate reduction faster than a 10-year phase in? You want to take that? You want Mainly, the main reason for phasing it in gradually is just to limit the disruption and the wealth changes. Uh, we know that because of deferred assets and deferred liabilities, there would be revaluation of companies based on the rate change, and Joanne went into, of course, a lot of detail about that. Um, I think it's undesirable to have you know, really dramatic wealth changes like that. How do you want to address that? Well, one possibility in principle would be to have a lot of company-level transition rules that would try to recapture windfall gains or try to compensate for windfall losses when the rate change affects various uh, specific provisions. 
uh, the complexity of that and the lobbying that would you know shape the form of that, uh, I think uh, the possibility that windfall um, losses would be compensated, but windfall gains not recaptured. I, there's just too many problems with that. So doing a gradual phase in uh, seems like a simpler way to uh, to mitigate the wealth effects. And, and thank you for the comment about the competent authorities. That is not something we had thought of, and that's that's another reason we had debated that going, and that's another reason to have done it. Yield our choice, Strategic Investment Group. Uh, I wish it would have been simpler. Um, I guess you put two very smart people drafting a, a, a tax <laughs> proposal, and you're going to end up with a very smart, complicated document. It is complicated, and, and I would have kept it simpler, because the markets do have a way of adjusting to even very flawed tax <coughs> systems. My suggestion is that you actually look at the impact on pension funding, because it's going to have a dramatic impact on the underfundedness of retirement liabilities at the corporate level and at the individual level, not to speak of health plans for uh, which would exacerbate it at a time in which the population is aging and needing a lot more savings there. Uh, so that's the, the question is, did you look at that? Did you look at the impact on pension plans and, and the degree to which they will become even more underfunded? The con I'm not sure I understand the concern about the underfunding. It's because the corporate rate is lower, so there's a smaller incentive to make deductible pension contributions. Mark to market, and they're taxing at the mark to market level. Oh, okay. We're we're not taxing the pension funds at the mark to market level. No, no, no. no. no they, they just have the flat rate tax. They would have the flat. No, or the no, no, not the non profit, non -profit no, either. No. Only individual shareholders. Yeah. Yes, it would. would. They're the would. 15 there would. There would. There would. 15% tax. 15% right. tax yeah. on the interest rate. But, but not the mark to market tax. Right. Okay. But that would be a huge effect because most pension funds have now moved to uh, LDI investing, liability driven investing, which is all based on very long duration assets, fixed income assets. But I think you need to take into account the benefits that pension plans, like other shareholders, would receive in terms of lower taxes being imposed on their shares of corporate they, stock. They have moved to fixed income because they want to hedge their liabilities. That's what you have to take into consideration. Well, now. obviously, the impact would vary from one pension fund to another or one retirement account to another, depending upon the mix of debt and equity. But you know, what we're aiming to do is to achieve a burden that's roughly comparable in total to the burden they face under current law, but that's more neutral between debt and equity. If the 15 percent rate yeah, I mean, it, it's possible changes could be made in the, in the details. So. Okay, let's yeah. see if we can squeeze in one more question. Steve? Uh, Steve Rosenthal. Um, question, what do you think the world will look like if your tax were enacted with the various clientele effects and the like? Uh, what will tax-exempt institutions end up holding, presumably non-U.S. stock and non-corporate bonds, maybe foreign stock, real property? Who will own U.S. stock in the brave new world? Uh, will it be foreigners over the U.S.? Uh, will U.S. shareholders end up owning more for foreign stock? What will, what will the world look like? I think most of the shifts that you mentioned probably would occur. Uh, the one exception, I think, is that I mean, because the 15 percent tax on interest income of pension funds would apply regardless of what type of bond is held, there'd be no reason for a pension fund to substitute from one type of bond to another. But I think most of the other shifts that you describe probably would occur. It is a tricky general equilibrium question. Yeah, I mean, I, in, in terms of holding corporate stock, I mean, you know, the, the proposal is to reduce the, the uh, corporate, corporate tax rate. Um, that is going to, I guess the question is, would they, would they buy foreign, more likely to buy foreign shares if the U.S. corporate rate is lower? I don't think so. But um. Okay, we have one minute left. So anybody have a really quick question? And they can probably have a really quick answer. Len. Alan, you referred to the withholding tax without credit for foreigners as a 
kind of optimal tariff. Have you thought about whether there could be WTO challenges to that? Well, so, so it's not the withholding tax. I mean, it's just a straight corporate income tax. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but, um, but I mean, it, there, there was a problem in Europe that the, I think the Germans had an imputation system and uh, they had to drop that's it. A, yeah. They're on that's a different a, set that's of an, that's an EU. Then, that's an EU problem. Like, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's yeah. not as an issue as we understand under the treaties that the United States is party to. Dan, did you want to comment? Right, I think Australia and New Zealand have sim- similar systems and they're not challenged. Yeah, no, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd probably have to reacquaint myself with some of this to address it. Okay, we are out of time. I want to thank uh, uh, Eric and Alan for the paper and Dan and Joanne for their comments and thank you all for coming.